Okay, then I start again and I say welcome everyone and bless Sabbath. We are so happy to have Brother Sami and Brother Wycliffe and Brother Sad um, but I said Sadok, Sami and Wycliffe with us. Good to see you all. So um, what's going on there in, in, in um, Kenya? I know that you had a week with uh, 14 people living in your house, Sadok. Did you survive? Yeah, 15. <laughs> yeah, we survived. We praise the Lord. <laughs> we, we thank the Lord that there was sufficient place uh, for the children of God to, to be here. Right. And we're winding up today and we praise God for that. Thank okay. you. Amen. And you have some nice Norwegian colors on you. Those are Norwegian colors. <laughs> I'm thankful that I was able to, <laughs> to right. match out. Right. Praise the Lord. So, yeah. Well, the platform is yours, and let's um, study together. Atonement is an important subject, and we were very blessed last time you were sharing with us. Yeah, sure. I'm thankful uh, for the opportunity. And before we pray, I want to... Uh, we are all joining in uh, right here from Kilgoris. And um, so as a church, that is, um, for this study, uh, they might be on the background, but we are glad to let you know that uh, we are happy to be with you people today and to study the word of God together. Anyways, if uh, I would... I would want to ask... Uh, if our brother uh, weekly or Sammy Whitbuffers is there, it may be easy for him than weekly for now to pray so that we might be able to get into study the atonement, the uh, second part of our panel discussion. Okay, we can pray. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord for this opportunity that you've granted us today once again, that we may learn from your word and we may hear you speaking to us and revealing to us the secrets of, uh, of eternity. Let your blessings and your Holy Spirit be upon us as we study together. We ask through the mighty name of your dear son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right. Um, Thank you so much. I'll be moderating today. And uh, last time we were actually going through the concept of the atonement. And I'll call forth Brother Sami to pick from where I left because uh, we were discussing the issue of uh, the latter rain uh, in connection with the atonement. And we we're also looking at the uh, spring and uh, the autumn feasts in connection with what's going on and what preparations you need to make. Before just we go to our first question, I would want Sami to recap because that's where we left the concept last time. And what we'll be looking at first uh, to get a right understanding of would be, do you think that the understanding of the atonement can be destroyed by a false understanding of the sonship of Jesus Christ, who Jesus Christ is. Can our false understanding, that's what we're gonna look at. If we have a wrong understanding of Jesus, who he is, will our understanding of our atonement all different and affect our spirituality? But before we go to that, Sam, you are looking at the thought of um, the spring and the autumn feasts. Would you please recap that concept so that we pick from there? Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Brother Zadok, and uh, I'm glad to join in and uh, we share in the word of God. And uh, uh, if I can remember where we left uh, the last time is uh, how this concept of atonement and uh, is connected to the latter rain. And uh, we were going through the feasts of the sanctuary and uh, how the Lord made them to be and how they are to uh, really tell us where we are in stream of time and what is expected of us. When you look at the atonement and uh, what used to happen, we have the atonement in the courtyard, which I know that uh, we shall be looking at it. 
and then we have the atonement in the holy place, and then the atonement in the most holy place, and all these are connected with the feast of the sanctuary. But I, I was looking at this issue of atonement in the spring and atonement in the autumn, or, or um, what we call in the summer, uh, and connecting it with the, the rain. When you look at the rain in the spring and what it has to achieve, it is not the same thing with what the rain in the autumn or summer or during the time of harvest uh, really achieves. You find that um, uh, the rain in the spring is to help uh, the farmer to uh, break the ground and uh, be able to provide a uh, ground where you can put the seed and it sprouts. And um, uh, that is in the spring feast when you look at um, uh, 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 the spring feast in the Passover, uh, in the fast fruit, and uh, uh, in the unleavened bread, where actually this the 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 the, the, the fast feast covered uh, the atonement in the in the courtyard, so that uh, uh, people may be prepared to enter into the holy place after accepting Jesus Christ as uh, uh, the uh, the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world at Calvary. But uh, now. Brother Zadok, when you come to the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the autumn feast, uh, the feast in the summer where we have the feast of the trumpet uh, welcoming in or ushering in the day of atonement, it is accompanied with uh, the, the latter rain. And uh, the latter rain, as we understand, it is um, to make uh, the harvest mature, to make it be able to withstand uh, the, the final stages of uh, the crop and uh, to be able to withstand the pest and all that. It means that um, the crop has been coming until this period of time when now it has to be removed from the garden and be put in the store and be used. And so we see that uh, this aligns, uh, the, the, the autumn feast uh, aligns with the, the day of the atonement and the feast of the tabernacles. In the day of atonement, what actually happens is um, the cleansing of the sanctuary, something that we are dealing with, the atonement in the most holy place, where actually an especial outpouring of the latter rain is given to the people, not to begin the work, but to end the work, to make them be prepared for the feast of the tabernacles, which is the harvest, uh, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ, so that uh, they may be able to dwell with uh, a holy God without a, a mediator. And so uh, when you look at the atonements in different uh, uh, parts of the sanctuary, you find that uh, it produces a different experience in those stages. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm thankful for that concept, Brother Shami, and realize that the essence of the atonement is actually to bring us to a point where God can restore the image of Jesus Christ in us. Uh, that's very important, how God can be able to restore the image of Jesus Christ in us. Very important. And, and so we hope that that can be accomplished. Now we will go straight to the first question for the day, having recapped where I left last time. Well, does a false understanding of the atonement interfere or rather the false understanding of who Jesus Christ is interfere with uh, our understanding of the atonement. If we have a wrong Jesus, can we have a, wrong, a right atonement? That's what you're looking at. Brother Wycliffe, and uh, then I would open the floor for any other person with a concept. Brother Sami, you can take it over. Uh, Wycliffe, what do you think about that? When you're talking about uh, the sonship of Jesus Christ, is it important to understand atonement? Thank you for, for that. Uh, I think uh, it is very much important to understand the sonship of Jesus Christ in relation to the atonement. Uh, because uh, we know first that uh, when sin came into the world, uh, the first time that our first parents, Adam and Eve, uh, sinned, uh, we realized that there had to be a perfect sacrifice to be offered in order for sin to be, uh, to be eliminated in the world. And uh, throughout the spirit of prophecy, we find that uh, when sin came, the angels offered themselves to come and die for man. But uh, 
that sacrifice was not enough to make sure that sin is done away with. And so we see that the only sacrifice that could, uh, could atone for sin is a, not a human sacrifice, but a divine sacrifice. And so we see Christ coming as a son of God in, and taking the human flesh, uh, we find humanity and divinity was combined and Christ living our lives, atoning for our sins. Uh, uh, when those two uh, natures combined into one man, Jesus Christ, that was the only sacrifice that could atone for our sins. So if we believe that the sacrifice that could only atone for our sin was Christ in his human flesh alone. No, the only sacrifice that could perfectly atone for the sin of man was humanity and divinity and humanity combined together in that one man called Jesus Christ. And so when Christ dies at the cross, he dies as a son of God, divine son of God. Well, so if, if we say that um, the sonship of Jesus Christ is not important for our for the atonement to be perfect. Then we we, we get it wrong. We will uh, we will not actually have a perfect sacrifice before God uh, that can that God Himself can uh, can accept. So I think it is important to believe that only a divine sacrifice will atone for our sins. And Jesus Himself coming down as a, a Son of God and in human flesh, he was able to accomplish that. Thank you for that. Thank you, Brother Weekly, for that concept. Uh, what do you think, Brother Sai? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Brother Zadok, for the question. You, you know, this morning I was uh, thinking about uh, the issue that uh, you have raised in question one, and uh, I'd like to refer us to Exodus chapter 12. We can turn there. I wish that uh, maybe Brother Teje can uh, make us co-host so that we can share the scriptures on the screen or uh, we, we, we shall just read them. But uh, how, if uh, he could have made us co-host, it will be better. Uh, the book of Exodus chapter 12, I want us to turn there as uh, he makes us co-hosts. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, I'll go straight to sharing my screen. Look at Exodus chapter 12. Uh, is the issue of uh, understanding the sonship of Jesus Christ uh, important in the issue of uh, atonement? Verse 1 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the tenth day of the month, they shall take to them every lamb, uh, a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. So they are taking the lamb on the tenth day. And what are they doing? If And if the household be a little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his, uh, his eating shall make you account for the lamb. Then comes the statement, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So you find that a lamb is taken from the sheep and or from the goats, and it's kept for four days. That is from the 10th day of the month to the 14th day of the month, which means that um, this lamb that was going to be offered for the sacrifice was a particular lamb. You didn't have just to go and pick any lamb from the sheep or goats, but it had to be separated for four days. What, do I mean, what do I mean by that? And how does it uh, make a difference about uh, uh, the, the sonship of Jesus Christ? If we can understand that he is the begotten of God separated from the sheep or the goats and taken to be examined so that he may pass uh, 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 the test of being the perfect sacrifice. If we don't understand his sonship well, then it affects atonement for, it means that uh, anyone can be picked on the road and is offered for atonement and then the atonement, the father can be satisfied. But as Brother Wycliffe has said that uh, 
it is important to understand who Jesus Christ is and his sonship, because uh, the famous verse that we read about in John 17, 3, that um, this is eternal life. And uh, by, uh, this is eternal life that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And so in him, actually, we find our redemption. We cannot find redemption in somebody who is less than the law that was broken. It needed somebody who is above or and equal to the law. So if we get the sonship of Jesus Christ wrong, then we get the atonement wrong. We get um, that uh, we will not understand the lamb that uh, was to be taken to the Calvary. And when we have the wrong lamb, brothers and sisters, then we have a wrong atonement. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I just wanted to add a few points before I open up for any question or any thought from uh, the other brethren. But when Mark begins to write, Mark begins to write by saying the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. You see, John says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's truth. That's not metaphorical. That's not dramatical. God gave a begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And as you have been able to state, God did give a true sacrifice. For we stated last time that without the remission, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission for sin. And so when Jesus Christ came into this planet, he came as a true son of God. And the understanding of that will help us to understand the extent to which the father went in suffering with his true son in order to bring us into oneness with himself. I'll give you a good example. And, and this might help you to understand better. The story of Abraham and Isaac is a story in which, which angels decide to look into. And in the story of Abraham and Isaac, Abraham was going to give his son as a burnt offering. You understand that in the sanctuary services, a burnt offering was given as a general a sacrifice for the congregation. And uh, what's happening is Isaac was one only begotten in the real sense. Of course, he had a son with Agar, but we know this was the only begotten son of promise. Uh, the only begotten son of promise, and he typified Jesus Christ. He was a true son. And there are more parallelisms I've been able to do that in a study before between Isaac and Jesus Christ. The pain that actually Abraham went through, the same pain that uh, uh, represents the pain that uh, God went through when his son was suffering on the cross. Now, if Isaac wasn't a true son, the right understanding of the relationship between Isaac and Abraham is very important in understanding the nature of sacrifice that Abraham gave. And so it is with the father. The sacrifice cannot be a sacrifice if the son is perhaps metaphorical. It is not a sacrifice if the son is metaphorical. So if we have a false understanding and concept about who Jesus Christ is, we must have a false understanding of what manner of sacrifice it is and how deeply the father suffers or suffered when his son went to the cross. If you look at Hebrews chapter one, the Bible refers to Jesus Christ as being created or being higher than the angels. Jesus Christ not being created rather, sorry for that, being uh, higher than the angels. Uh, Jesus Christ being begotten of the father was above the angels because he created the angels. Sorry for the word I used. But then when he came as a human, uh, uh, um, um, as our example, Jesus Christ had to be lower than the angels, you see, for the plan of salvation to be complete so that that perfect combination could be accomplished. So that that which was equal to God be made equal to humanity so that he can go and chart a way for us on how, and how we can overcome sin. And that is why the Bible says that Christ, that God could only overcome, of, of, overcome sin through the flesh. What does that mean? 
through Christ becoming our example, taking this fable model human nature so that it could be a perfect sacrifice for us. And being a perfect sacrifice also makes him a perfect high priest. So I think if we have a false understanding of who Jesus Christ was, especially before he came here, we must have a wrong understanding of the atonement because God will have given us a false son, one who is not his son, or we'll be having a false Christ impersonating as a true Christ. He's not a true Christ. So I think that the problem in Christendom, why there's a lot of varied views about the atonement is, the, is, is actually rooting out of a false understanding of who Jesus Christ is. In fact, most of us do not understand that Christ is the literal son of God. All right, I want to open if someone has a thought or an idea or a question, you would be free as we continue discussing that matter. I want just to share a, a short comment um, because I know it, just the fact that we are discussing this matter is, uh, is in a way very, uh, very interesting or sad because there is no clearer truth told in the Bible than Jesus Christ being the son of the living God. And it is, it is, it is amazing how the devil could, could, could wreck this truth in the minds of so many people and sincerely believe us also. I mean, there is no way to substantiate any other truth than Jesus Christ being the Son. For God so loved the world, that is the verse everybody cites, every Christian knows this verse by heart, that he gave his only begotten Son. How can this be twisted into Jesus not being the Son of God? This is a, a mysterium to me. And it, it, is a, it, is a, it is a spiritual uh, battle, of course, so there is a lot of things involved but this is just so terrible in a way that such a simple truth can be so so lost in the world that's just my comment on that one yeah we know that the doctrine of the trinity has <laughs> destroyed the concept of the atonement because we are having one who is co-equal with the father and we know that god is immortal so when God is immortal, because that's what Paul, Paul writes to the young Timothy as a young evangelist, he had to understand that only God was immortal. So we are having Jesus Christ who, could, uh, who was equally immortal. So I think um, in heaven. So um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, immortality is a gift of the father that he gives to his son and he will give to all of us if we believe, uh, if we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. But then now Jesus Christ comes here as the son of God and being the son of God, he could be able to die. So the understanding of the um, uh, uh, sonship of Jesus Christ is very important to help us understand uh, rather uh, the atonement. Uh, brother uh, Van, before we go to Brother Sami, if you'll allow us, Brother Sami, you would allow Brother Van to take it over. I can see you aren't rest, Brother Van. There's, there's a number of things here that have to happen first in, the, in this understanding of atonement, we have to understand that first, um, for him to be a redeemer, he must have first held possession. And only the son of the original possessor can redeem. Um, and in understanding this concept, the bride is redeemed. So the bride was once his, therefore no one else could redeem her. Um, this this is the principle we first have to look at. And, and that having been said, then we look at the points that you're bringing up. Because for atonement, at one moment to be restored, it has to be recognized that it once was. Um, and the only one that can do so is of that house. So Christ became one like us that he might redeem us, though we were made in his likeness and image in the first place. So there's so many concepts here that defy this idea uh, of metaphorical. 
because metaphorical can never be the original. It can only be analogous. Whereas Christ was the original and remains such. It is us that changed and went out of relationship to bring us back. We must be convinced that we were once like him. And one more point. The, this all started before the Council of Nicaea with the concept to be divine, you must be eternal without beginning. This is a human concept because of our inability to acknowledge that the Father can bring forth without creating. He can bring forth of himself, which is divine, um, whereas created is not. It is made out of created matter or not like matter. And when we accept that, only then can we understand what Sister White said, unbegotten, underived actually comes from Scripture. Because if it is only a divine characteristic, then he cannot give it to us. Eternal life can be given. And therefore, if he can give it to us, he could have also received it. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Wonderful thoughts there. Well, Brother Sam, you wanted to say something just before we cross over. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, really, um, I think uh, uh, the brother uh, who has uh, gone before me, has uh, Brother Van, has uh, talked about it. What I wanted, the concept I wanted to bring out is found in Genesis chapter 1, and uh, we can just rush there, uh, Genesis chapter 1. It is interesting to, to look at uh, what uh, the Bible says from the beginning. And uh, uh, I start from verse 11, Genesis chapter 1 and uh, verse 11. We read that, uh, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. This is much more to understand even the nature of Jesus Christ. And he say, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Uh, my word thereafter his kind. Now, looking at the concept of atonement, Christ, who was essentially God, has to provide with us um, a divine nature to be able to overcome sin. But when he comes, he can't come in the, in the kind of God. Uh, I hope this uh, can be understood uh, because every seed had to produce of its own kind. And so, essentially being God, he now has to come as a kinsman redeemer. That is Leviticus chapter 25. And um, uh, we are told in Leviticus chapter 25, and um, that is uh, verses, uh, let me look at it, verses, um, verses 40, 47 going downward. Uh, just uh, blow it on the screen. Leviticus um, 25. Let me see if this is the place. And uh, if a sojourner or a stranger works rich by thee and thy brother that dwelleth by him works poor and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee or to the stock of the stranger's family. After that he is sold, he may re be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. One of his brethren. Now we are talking of Christ who is essentially God, but the redeeming part has to be taken with one who is of the same family of those who are sold. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin unto him, of his family may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. Now, the stranger that works all a ministers is the devil. He uh, was uh, thrown down here and uh, Adam uh, was created, but then he overcame Adam, and now Christ has to come and be part of uh, the human family. But uh, he cannot impart anything as a human. He has to come uh, 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 and take our nature, the divinity combined with humanity, so that we may be partakers of the divine nature. He may overcome as human beings overcome and then give us the same victory. In fact, Christ being made as human beings is um, uh, uh, to answer the charge of uh, the devil that uh, no human being can be able to overcome sin. And so he comes essentially from God and takes a form of the servant and then overcomes as human beings would be able to overcome and then shows us an example. And then 
uh, uh, when uh, he lives a sinless life, is resurrected by the Father and ascends up to heaven. Now his divinity mingled with humanity, that victory he gives unto us so that we may be able to overcome sin. And so one thing that we have to realize that uh, a wrong concept of Jesus Christ really and a wrong concept of who he is will give us a wrong atonement, will give us a wrong glory because we shall be looking into the things which are not there. And if our foundation be based on uh, that which is not truth, then the glory shall not be the true glory. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, brother. And uh, indeed, we are we are seeing and agreeing that this idea and concept of a Christ who is called equally the Father degrades the atonement. It, it leaves us with nothing other than a human atonement, a human sacrifice, which is very dangerous to the plan of salvation. As Brother Wycliffe said earlier, that anything that gives us anything less than a divine son of God dying for us is very detrimental for our salvation. Brother Van, you wanted to say something? I can see your hand is up if you don't mind. Because Spirit of Prophecy puts it in another category. Spirit of Prophecy tells us that the wrong concepts of divinity are as much idolatry of the, as that as of wood and of stone. And so there's many things maligned by a wrong concept because all idolatry and false worship is, is a wrong concept of God. And therefore a wrong concept of his son would also be idolatry. Praise the Lord. Uh, that's very clear. And indeed anything that destroys the atonement destroys the own economy of truth. So that's very important. Well, we want to think about something else as we just developed. So Jesus Christ comes down here and he attacks our nature, the nature of Adam after the fall. And he goes to the cross and he dies. We know that Christianity looks at this death and Christianity think, hey, this death is the whole atonement. Well, do you think the understanding of the atonement being complete in the cross in itself, in the holy place in itself, and the final phase of the atonement on behalf of humanity in the most holy place, which is what is going on right now in the day of atonement. Do you think when Alan White uses the phrase, a complete atonement on the cross, would this suggest a universal uh, salvation. This suggests that everything done on behalf of humanity and their destiny is complete on the cross and that there is no more atonement going on in heaven or perhaps there is no two apartment sanctuary to apartment ministry in heaven. What do you think about this concept that um, tells us that atonement on the cross, as perhaps is used in the spirit of prophecy, would again amount to universal uh, salvation. What do you think about that, uh, Brother Wycliffe? Does that atonement amount to universal salvation? Um, I can answer. Uh, I can answer. I can answer. I can answer. I can answer. Sorry. Okay, can you hear me, Brother Zodo? I can hear you, but there is an echo uh, from your end. Okay, you okay. get it still? We can All hear right, you. Um, I can say that, uh, we can say that the, the sacrifice that Christ did at the cross, uh, covered all sins of men. And, uh, and that atonement uh, covered, uh, there are those who are ignorantly breaking the law of God. They have not come to the truth. And so uh, still that atonement covers for them, but it doesn't mount to universal uh, uh, salvation where we can say that now Jesus died for us, we can, all of us, it doesn't matter what we do, we are saved, always saved, 
or one safe, always safe. No. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, the word underlined there is whosoever. So Christ died for humanity. But that does not mean that now everyone will go to heaven. No, only those who believe in the son or in Jesus Christ as our sin pardoning savior will inherit in eternal life or will be saved. So I don't say that it amounts to universal salvation that all now can go to heaven. No, it, it remains with us, every individual to make a decision personally to follow or to accept the benefits of the atonement of Jesus Christ at Calvary. Yes. Thank you, Brother Weekly, for that thought. Uh, Brother Sami, what do you think? Okay. Then I could give Eva, she wants to ask a question. Thank you. A comment. Oh, yeah. Um, I was thinking about in heaven before, you know, when the fall uh, happened. Then uh, um, the, the Satan said to the angels, oh, it's impossible for mankind to keep the law of God. So uh, God had to show on the cross, Jesus took uh, our penalty, but he also had to show somehow the angels that God is able to give us victory, that we can, can live in accordance to, to, the, to the will of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that, Sister Eva. God bless you. Brother John, uh, your hand is up. I uh, want to give you this moment to, you are muted anyways. I'll just have a short uh, a short comment to uh, to the question also before that this uh, atonement was was perfect or was was fully made on the cross. And uh, uh, it is this, uh, this beautiful uh, uh, quote uh, from uh, which I just I just share in the chat and then I read it because it's uh, it's it's quite uh, comprehensive as to what we are talking about here. And it's from uh, it says, "Do you realize your sinfulness? Do you despise sin? Then remember that the righteousness of Christ is yours if you will grasp it." Can you not see what a strong foundation is placed beneath your feet when you accept Christ? God has accepted the offering of his son as a complete atonement for the sins of the world. So that is, that is also where, where she uses the complete atonement for the sins of the world. But then it continues. True faith, which relies wholly upon Christ, will be manifested by obedience to all the requirements of God. In all ages, there have been those who claimed a right to the favor of God, even while they were disregarding some of his commands. But the scriptures declare that by works is faith made perfect, and that without the works of obedience, faith is dead. So that, I Praise believe, is, is, a, is a beautiful uh, uh, connection to, to faith and works again, you know. Praise the Lord for that. That's, that's, that's a beautiful connection indeed. And we are thankful for that, Brother John. Um, Brother Sam, do you want to say something? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brother Zadok, for the opportunity. Uh, it is believed that uh, Christ made uh, an atonement uh, at Calvary for finality of everything and uh, everyone can be just be enrolled in the books of heaven. But um, this uh, will not even go with the typological aspects of the sanctuary uh, for the sanctuary its end will meet at the courtyard rather than going into the holy place and into the most uh, holy place. Yes, Christ died for everyone on Calvary and he says you that you. you lost me. Are we still together? Yes. Sounds good here. Yeah. And uh, you see, in John chapter 1, we are told that for those who accepted him, he gave them power to become the sons of God. And so 
even though Christ made an atonement on Calvary, we are called to accept him. But I want to bring out uh, something uh, that um, maybe people haven't considered, and we have discussed this uh, sometime. On the day of atonement, the priest, uh, the high priest did not only sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, he came back from the most holy place and sprinkled the blood on the altar in the, uh, in the place uh, uh, of congregation. It's called uh, in the tabernacle of congregation. And uh, there's something uh, amazing that Sister White talks about this sprinkling of the blood uh, on the day of atonement in the tabernacle of congregation, which is uh, at the courtyard. And uh, I, I like to share it uh, uh, on the screen in early writing page uh, 254 early writing page 254, which uh, really brings us to the real matter that uh, even on the day of atonement, the courtyard also have to be clean. It was not just uh, uh, on Calvary that that atonement for the courtyard was finished, but also in the day of atonement, the courtyard has to be cleansed and it is called the final atonement and the final intercession. Look at this, early writing 254.1. As the ministration of Jesus closed in the holy place and he passed into the holiest and stood before the ark containing the law of God, he sent another mighty angel with a third message to the world. So this is in the time period of the third angel's message in the loud cry. A parchment was placed in the angel's hand and as he descended to the earth in power and majesty, he proclaimed a fearful warning with the most terrible threatening ever born uh, to man. This message was designed to put the children of God upon their guard by showing them to the hour of temptation and anguish that was before them. Say the angel, they will be brought into close compact with the beast and his image. Their only hope of eternal life is to remain steadfast. Although their lives are at stake, they must hold fast the truth. The third angel message closes his message thus. Here is the patient of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. As he repeated these words, he pointed to the heavenly sanctuary. Now we are talking about what is going on in the heavenly sanctuary. And at this period of the loud cry and the third angel's message, what is going on in the heavenly sanctuary? The minds of all who embrace this truth are directed to the most holy place where Jesus stands before the ark, making his final intercession for all those for whom mercy still lingers and for those who have ignorantly broken the law of God. This atonement is made for the righteous dead as well as the righteous living. It includes all who died trusting in Christ, but who not having received the light upon God's commandments had sinned ignorantly in transgressing uh, it is precept. So we find that um, during the loud cry, during the swelling of the third angel's message, uh, Christ is not only making an atonement for those who know his commandments, but those who are dead and those who never knew about the commandments of God. And in order for you to know the commandments of God, you must enter into the most holy place where there is the Ark of Covenant, which means this atonement for the people who broke the law of God ignorantly, it means they never entered into the most holy place. It means that they were in the other apartments, yet they walked according to the truth they knew. And so the question was that uh, did the dying of Jesus Christ at Calvary make that atonement and the finality of the atonement, I can say according to the scripture and Leviticus chapter 16 and early writing 254 that actually it just covered the atonement for that part in that season, but the final atonement also even covers the courtyard. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord, uh, Brother Sami. Uh, there's a concept by Brother Van there on the chat section. I want to read it. Before I read it, I want to say this. I like what you brought up in the last phase of your comment. Um, there is a work that was complete in itself at the cross. And that's why Ellen White says complete. So as our understanding as someday Adventists who are staying upon the platform of truth should be biblical. And so there is an atonement that is complete in itself at the cross, but the atonement is not wholly complete. What do I mean? This is what I mean. Um, sin came into the world and it demanded an atonement 
to bridge the gap between man and humanity. And that phase was complete. When Jesus Christ came, he did not leave that phase halfway. But the whole process of bringing man into unity with God was not complete in this sense. At the cross, the father paid the price for sin through the sacrifice of his son. But now when we enter into the sanctuary, we are brought into a close nearness with God so that we are in the image and likeness of God. That is why the scripture as atonement in the outer court, cross, atonement in the holy place, and atonement in the most holy place. The atonement in the outer court is like instantaneous or looks like universal justification in this sense. It avails certain blessings to every single human being on this planet. Now, sin was actually going to cut off every blessing that flows from heaven to earth, including the blessing of rain and sun. You see that? The atonement was actually not only made on behalf of a sinning humanity. The atonement was made on behalf of the other creation. In fact, the land was atoned for. You remember the blood was also poured uh, 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 to, on, the, on the ground. The blood was poured on the ground, symbolic of atonement for the earth. In fact, your farm would not produce if it were not for that atonement. So the death of Jesus Christ is a face of atonement that take care of those who are sinning in ignorance. What about children who have not reached the age of making decisions? What actually takes care of them? That atonement in the cross. What about in the days of ignorance when God wings? What happens to the rain and the food and all the blessings that we receive? We are breathing toxic air, but we are still living. Remember, when sin came, there was a break up of communication between God and man. Now, God had only to communicate through Christ and his son, step in restoration of humanity. That was already a step. Through Christ and angels, God communicated to humanity. Listen to what Ellen White says in The Sour of Ages, if you don't mind. It must be page 210. The world has become, paragraph 2. You could project it for those of us to be able to appreciate 210, paragraph number 2. Uh, I'm not able to project that, but it says the world had been committed to Christ. And then she says, and through him has come every blessing from God to fallen human race. He was the redeemer before his incarnation. You see that? Christ was the redeemer. He was the sacrifice given before the foundations of the world. Revelation 3 verses 13 verses number 8. And then it says, as soon as there was sin, there was a savior. He was given, he has given light and life to all. And according to the measure of light given each is to be judged. So you can be able to see. According to the light given each be served. Be as, as, as soon as there was sin, there was a savior. So you see that that sacrifice was given from the very onset. The problem with many um, uh, of our Pentecostal evangelical brothers who are promoting this concept of universal salvation, who are promoting predestination and so on, like all Calvinist sort of ideas, is that they think that all that Jesus Christ did on the cross was complete. Therefore, they destroy the progression of that work in the sanctuary above. And we know that many in the Adventist cycles are drinking into that theology so that we don't agree that, if we, we, so that they, are, they, they propose that if the plan of salvation was in itself complete, the atonement was complete in the cross, then there is no need of the uh, two apartment ministry of Christ in heaven. And probably we don't have 1844. We don't have 1844. When we have Jesus Christ offering an atonement, being offered as a burnt offering at Calvary, 
uh, 31 AD, being offered at Calvary in 31 AD, he atones for the soil, he atones for the creation in terms of trees and animals who are also groaning for that salvation and coming of Jesus Christ. You see, when we understand it that way, then we understand that the buying of that which was lost or the redeeming of that which was lost is not complete until the sins go because the priest had to carry the blood into the holy place and then wait for the final day of atonement. I want to call it the final day of atonement from whence there is no more atonement on behalf of humanity. So it's important to understand that they are not wrong, but yes, they are wrong because there is an atonement there, but it is not the whole thing. There is an atonement also in the holy place and there is the final atonement. And the final atonement cannot be final and complete if there is no atonement on the cross and there is no atonement in the holy place. Why do I say that? You cannot have the third angel's message without the first and the second. So there is no final atonement if Christ did not go through the atonement in Calvary and then the atonement in the holy place. Uh, thank you, Brother Van. Perhaps the thoughts that you are putting up could be brought better if you, if you spoke. Go ahead, uh, Brother, if you have an opportunity. Uh, uh, no, I see in all of this, I see in all of this that we, we need our eyes to be on who the presenter of this is. Th this is the Father himself that puts forward all this effort through Christ. And Spirit of Prophecy tells us at the very moment, to edify what you have said, at, ev at the very moment in which sin entered, Christ stepped between Adam and certain death. Because Adam, in stepping away from God, had separated himself from the source of life. Like us hitting the light switch, it gets dark instantly. Uh, without the presence of Christ's glory, we are in darkness, the symbolism there. And to me, when I saw this, it took it way beyond Christ himself being willing to come and took it to the Father having, in his wisdom, met, brought forth Christ before all of this began, that if this happened, there was no delay. I saw this same grace that when uh, sin transpired, as Christ was put forward as a solution already prepared, we saw the same thing. We're told when Satan and his hosts were cast out, that the father turned immediately to his son and said, us, let us make man now. So in this, we see the immensity of God's grace is that perchance there be a problem. He already has a way. He is not willing that even Satan and his fallen hosts should suffer for an unduly length of time because he cast them down to this earth, to utter darkness. It was void and empty and without form. And here was the lot now of Satan and the fallen hosts, same as we see in Jeremiah, it will be in the latter end. Yet the father himself was not willing that Satan should suffer beyond what was necessary to understand what was going forth. And, and to me, this is, this is far more, if, if we had this same character, we would have the desire for the lost that Christ and the Father have for us. They're not willing that for any, any, any longer than necessary that anyone should suffer. What, what a, a grand understanding of the purpose of the law. You know, all, as I put in the earlier post, nothing that has been given to us is unnecessary, and yet we have nothing apart from the gift. The very desire to be saved is provided. The very path to be saved is provided. Everything is provided that is necessary. And yet, without us making that choice, which denies universalism, we have that free choice to choose to receive it or not to receive it, which is back to the garden. Adam had the choice whether to retain it or to give it away. And uh, this, this, to me, really adds to it. It's not just that it was necessary. It's necessary for the first law of heaven, free choice to be sustained, that you and I have something from which to choose and then to have made that choice. We can't hear you, Brother Sadak. We praise the Lord for that, Brother Van, and 
Friends of Jesus, there are two of us with our comments there, Brother uh, Sami, Sister Eva, perhaps Sister Eva, then Brother Sami, if you don't mind. And then we'll see. we about four minutes to completing. Yeah, I'm thinking about what the Brother Vern was saying about God's patience. When I think about even Lucifer, when he made war in heaven, he was, you know, they were trying to get him back. And they were doing everything that he should ask about forgiveness for what he had been, you know, stirring up this uh, battle in heaven. And he was just on the border of confessing when, you know, proudness took him. So he, you know, went the other way. So God is so patient. He's so patient with Lucifer. How much patience should we have to others? And we're thankful that his God is so patient with us. Long suffering to us what? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yes, and, uh, yes. Uh, when I, I think about the concept of uh, atonement happening in the courtyard on the uh, day of atonement, uh, Brother Zadok, I'm overwhelmed with uh, the patience of God and the long suffering, because once uh, 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 the Lord entered into the most holy place, that is where He could have ended His atonement. But again, on that day of atonement, he comes all over to the holy place and then the, 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 uh, the tabernacle of congregation, you're looking at uh, Leviticus chapter 16, 15 and 16. This is in the setup of the day of atonement. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is of the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And then he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. This concept of atonement uh, uh, happening in the courtyard once again during the day of atonement shows how merciful God is and how long suffering he is. The same concept can be found in Ezekiel chapter 10. You find that uh, the children of Israel had been sinning in Ezekiel chapter 8. And in Ezekiel chapter 9, there is the slaying of the sinners and the angel with the inkhorn is going about his work. But in Ezekiel chapter 10, you find that the angels are coming from the sanctuary, but um, they, they, they reside at the threshold and the glory of the Lord is there, meaning that the Lord is still lingering upon his people. I'm not promoting that um, we may remain in the courtyard, the atonement in the day of atonement will uh, cover us in the courtyard, no. But uh, I'm trying to see how God is so merciful that even in the day of atonement, he remembers even those who are still in the courtyard. And uh, we saw that these are the people who are breaking the commandments of God ignorantly. And so it really shows how our God is patient and long suffering. And it teaches us to have the same character because the reason why we are Christian is to practice what Christ practiced and what he's practicing right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Sami. And uh, indeed, uh, as we wind up, we won't take the next question until the next time. As it is written in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespass unto them. And he hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You see, Christ came into this world that he may be God's ambassador to represent to us God. He tells Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He came to this world as God's representative. And now at that particular time, when he was going to the cross, uh, Christ was now standing at the head of the human race to represent this world to God. And um, it's very important for us to see that um, in the plan of salvation, what goes on in the outer court, or what goes on in the cross is very vital for what goes on in the sanctuary apartments to be complete and to be uh, efficacious. In fact, if we have um, a wrong foundation at the outer court, we cannot have a right holy place experience and the right 
most only plays experience. I think, um, allow me to say, and perhaps you might not agree with me and I respect that. I think sometimes we have overemphasized on the most only plays experience and neglected the outer court experience. And that's why many of the Sunday Adventists do not have a real most holy place experience. We can only have a real most holy place experience if we understand what was going on in the outer court or at the cross. And at the cross is where we lay everything, every self. It is, uh, it is what Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. This is your reasonable service. And so it's at the outer court where Jesus Christ is born. That is where he dies. And we know that the Bible says that if a seed does not die, in other words, if a seed is not barren, it abideth alone. What does it mean it abideth alone? It does not produce two or three or 10 seeds. For you to get five or 10 seeds from one seed of maize, the only miracle that can be done is to plant that seed. And so Christ, the selfless service of Christ that leads him to the death on the cross, the experience in the outer court, where he says, for you to follow me, you must begin by self-denial and cross-bearing. The outer court experience. And being buried to die into self, that is what it means to give birth to many sons. And so Christ could only represent the world as sons and daughters of God if himself died to everything that this world offers, the pride, the selfishness, the covetousness, and everything. And that happens in the outer court. So in the outer court, Christ represents to us what we must be in order to grow as Christians. And that growth experience is very important. So I think when you talk about the atonement in the outer court, we are not talking about complete completion of the plan of redemption. But we are talking about a stage which must be complete in itself for the other stages to begin in the first place. So if that experience is not complete, then we cannot have a full experience in the holy and in the most holy place. I don't know if there is any other ideas before I give you a final word, Brother Sami, and any other fun one to give a final word. I want us to keep time. The next two set of questions are related so we can get another time to look at it. Um, if you have a final thought, uh, it's open. Brother Weekly, praise the Lord. Go ahead. Well, we thank God for the, for the discussion. I'm really uh, gaining a lot. Uh, as I look at the whole uh, atonement issue, I see a great advantage that uh, as humanity we have. Uh, the sonship of Jesus Christ, his divine sacrifice gives us uh, a way out and uh, also gives us confidence that we can overcome sin. We can overcome sin. And it is possible that when we are obedient, just as he was a son, yet he was he learned to be obedient to his father. And we accept the benefits of his sacrifice. Him having, uh, bearing all our sins then I have hope that I can be saved. So that is one uh, aspect of this atonement that I really like. Another thing is that Christ is in the most holy place, is still pleading for our sins. And uh, when we are faithfully following him, wherever I go, in Revelation chapter 13, uh, 14, we are seeing the saints, 144 in number, who have accepted the benefits of atonement of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, are with him on Mount Zion. And therefore, the final demonstration of a people who are going to vindicate the character of God is very possible. It's very possible. And so what we need to do is that to accept 
Christ in totality and what he offered for us. In Romans chapter 5, verses 10 says that, uh, I am going to read that, then I, I close, uh, uh, finish up. In Romans chapter 5, verses 8, it says that, uh, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 5, verses 10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That is so much profound that by the life of Jesus Christ, if we accept him, the all atonement that is done for us, we shall be saved. Thank you. Man, thank you, Brother Wiki. Brother Sami. I know that uh, we, we, we are out of time, but uh, uh, Brother Zadok, you brought about uh, the seed analogy, which I think that uh, we shall look into that concept much more in the most holy place experience. But it is so interesting that the seed dies or it's planted in the, in the courtyard. When the seed is planted in the courtyard, what you find in the holy place is the candlestick, which has the branches, and we are told we are those branches. But you only find leaves on the branches. It is only when you enter into the most holy place that you find the fruits, the pomegranate fruits on the garment of the high priest. And so it is interesting, the idea that you brought about the seed analogy. And uh, you cannot have the pomegranates in the holy place on the hem of the garment of the high priest if the seed was not planted in the courtyard and it sprouted and it gave the branches in the holy place. May, may the Lord bless us for these uh, revelations. And uh, there is no way the holy place can work without the courtyard. And so my parting short will be in First Peter chapter 2, uh, uh, verses 21 to 25. I think uh, uh, this is interesting to me. For even here unto were he called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did not sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. This is 144 Revelation chapter 14. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not but committed himself to him that judged righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin, that is the most holy place experience, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. Again, you see the combination of the courtyard and the most holy place. For ye were a sheep going astray, but are now turned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. May the Lord bless us with these words. And as we continue studying, may we not just have information, but uh, may we continue having the experience of the information we have. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Salvation was made possible to everyone or whosoever wills at the cross. Not everyone was saved at the cross. The whole world was not saved in the sense that all of them will go to heaven but it was made available to every single child of God who wants to tap into it through the faith and grace of Jesus Christ. May God bless us and God keep us, everyone. And I'll ask Brother Wycliffe to pray for us, and then I'll give it back to Sister Eva. We are praying. We are praying. We are praying. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for such a wonderful opportunity you've granted us that we, when we believe in your son, Jesus Christ, we become sons and daughters of Christ and of God. Dear Lord, we are praying that all this that we've studied today may transform us, that we may fully reflect the lovely image of your son, Jesus Christ. Give us your Holy Spirit, strengthen us, give us wisdom, Give us grace more abundantly. For this we ask, trusting, uh, asking and believing through the mighty name of your dear son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. I think uh, it's so uh, important that we bring up this subject here because in church you never hear about it anymore. And uh, so uh, to get, get a deeper understanding, and uh, I believe that we also get the closer relationship with Christ, we understand this a little deeper. So uh, through eternity, we are going to study, right, brothers and sisters? So uh, there's always something to learn. So thank you so much, um, 
Brother uh, Sadok and Brother Sammy and Walter Wycliffe for joining us today. And, um, and um, hopefully we can soon have another study. <laughs>